so again, my name is Igor Gimmelstein. I'm the CFO of Medrelief. Um, it's been a few fateful days, I'll just point out. Um, as of Friday, officially, we are a uh, unicorn uh, crossing the $1 billion mark in market capitalization. So it's been a, a really interesting journey from the founding of the company in February 2013 until now. Uh, and we're quite happy with the progress. So appreciate everybody taking the time. So just some forward-looking information. Uh, obviously, we will look at some forward-looking statements. And so uh, caution to the wind. Uh, please review everything in detail on CDAR, which is the Canadian equivalent of EDGAR. So at Medrelief, uh, when we set out to build this business, uh, we did it with the objective of emerging as a leader. We fundamentally believe that consolidation, uh, whether by acquisition or attrition, uh, will happen in this space similarly to the way it has happened in pharma, brewery, beverage, and consumer products where if you look across the world and specifically in the United States and North America, uh, you clearly see a, a concentration of market value uh, and of product leadership uh, across each of these industries. And we'll show you hopefully over the course of this presentation why we believe Medrelief is best positioned to emerge as the global industry leader in medical cannabis and cannabis more broadly. So first, um, decisions that set the standard. Uh, I'll walk you through over the course of the presentation five fundamental decisions that you see on the left side of the slide that we really think sets Medrelief apart. Um, on the right side of the page, I think, is, is a really interesting proof point. Uh, as Alan mentioned, we were one of the first 14 applicants to get a license. Since uh, the passage of time, there are now 64 licenses, so a full 50 more than the original set. And despite that, Medrelief has had a quarter-on-quarter -quarter market share in terms of volume of product shipped of 18 to 20 percent, quarter in and quarter out. And we do believe that that is a very relevant proof point to our market leadership. And we'll chat more about that as we go through. So first and foremost, setting the standard in terms of financial performance. Um, to level set, I think it's widely accepted that cannabis that's cultivated indoors is considered a premium product to that cultivated in a greenhouse and that cultivated outdoors. Now quality manifests itself in many ways. There's objective measures of quality, product consistency, product potency, product bio burden, and there's subjective uh, levels of quality, similar to if you like wine, a bouquet or terroir. But ultimately, this bears out in price. And if you look at benchmarks that are available on the west coast of the United States, you'll see that there is a clear delta in price, both in wholesale and retail, between cannabis that's cultivated indoors and that that's cultivated in a greenhouse. Currently, it's about a 25 to 30 percent delta. In fact, interestingly, it's even a bigger delta than that between greenhouse and outdoor cultivation. And so at Medrelief, we wanted to set the standard in terms of performance by cultivating this high quality premium cannabis at a cost that's in line with the best in class greenhouse peers. And so the key factor in how we're able to do that is our throughput efficiencies. So if you benchmark our uh, throughput metric of grams per square foot per year, we do about 300 grams per square foot per year. The next best competitor does slightly less than 150. Ultimately, what this translates to is a cash cost per gram of $1.50. So high growth with strong margins. Um, what's key here is not the growth in revenue and volumes that we've been the beneficiaries of in the market and also have performed well on an individual basis, but rather on the right side of the page. If you look at the pricing that we achieve is about $9 a gram, a cash cost of about $1.50. What that nets to today is 70% adjusted product contribution margins, or if you want to put it a different way, gross profit per gram. What's most interesting here is not the price nor the cost, but rather the delta between the two. We believe that we have more torque in our business model to withstand the industry changes and dynamics, especially as we see disintermediation coming down the pipe. Whether that's wholesale disintermediation or retail disintermediation, we believe that if any company in this industry can be profitable, it is going to be Medrelief. And I think we've proven that in spades to date. So focus on profitability. Last year, on 40 million of revenue, we did nearly 14 million of EBITDA. This is clean EBITDA, no uh, biological asset adjustments here. Uh, so this is actual cash flow. Um, 
one of the other key ways we're able to generate this significant profitability, which is far and away the highest of all of the peer group in Canada, is a focus on customer lifetime value. So it's illustrated here. If you look at the national average in terms of consumption per patient per day, you're somewhere in the range of three quarters of a gram per day. At MedRelief, we're nearly two times that. And we'll talk about our focus on channels and high value patients as we go through the presentation. <clears throat> so this is a look at our first cultivation facility. It's located about 20 minutes uh, north of Toronto. Uh, it's in Markham, 55,000 square feet, 23,500 square feet of cultivation. And if you think back to the metric which I described of 300 grams per square foot per year, you multiply that on the 23,500, gets you to about seven tons or 7,000 kilograms of annual capacity. So this facility was built out in stages. Uh, we started building it in February of 2014 after receiving the license from Health Canada and completed it subsequently and are now looking to replicate the success we've had here as the most productive cultivation facility per square foot per year that exists anywhere in the world. <clears throat> so we've done our expansion, uh, in at least the first stage of it, in Bradford which is a city about 30 minutes north of our first cultivation facility, still in the greater Toronto area, 210,000 square feet, which is four times the size of Markham, and will ultimately generate four times the cultivation capacity. I think very interestingly, and to debunk some of the myths that exist in terms of uh, needing to acquire licenses, or as they call them, late stage applicants, we only bought this building in the end of the summer 2016, it was licensed in April of 2017, and we actually completed our first harvest with really high quality and yields slightly above expectations in July of 2017. So net-net, less than 12 months to go from buying an empty building to actually having harvest out the door. And I think what that shows is an ability to navigate the regulatory framework and an ability to deploy capital effectively without needing to pay anybody a multiple of asset value in order to take over their operations. Um, one of the key questions that we get is, you know, if the building is 210,000 square feet, why are you only doing four times the cultivation space if you're saying cultivation is 23,500 in Markham? And the reason is there are many things in this building that we believe will help us to maintain our market leading advantage in terms of margins on a price per gram basis and a cost per gram basis, including research and development laboratories, industrial kitchen, and ultimately pharmaceutical manufacturing. Now, there are lots of questions about geographic concentration or geographic dispersion in Canada. Uh, some people believe that it's important to have facilities across multiple jurisdictions. Uh, some people believe in concentration of facilities for logistical purposes. Um, we haven't made our decision. So far, we've concentrated our operations in the greater Toronto area for a couple of reasons. Primarily, talent. We believe we're able to attract and retain the best of the best by being in the largest and, frankly, most important city uh, in the country, and I say most important in terms of being the technological uh, and healthcare hub for the country. The other benefit of this is logistical and operational efficiencies. We're able to service on a same day basis over 5 million people in the greater Toronto area catchment. So what that means is if you place your order before 1 p.m., we're able to have a delivery at your door between 5 and 9 p.m. that same evening. The idea here is to eliminate the excuse that people use for going to illegal dispensaries, which is convenience. We say, what's more convenient? Going and taking a risk of enforcement, a risk of product contamination by going down the street, or sitting at your desk, placing an order, and having it appear in your, at your home in a nondescript package that same very day. Okay. So now let's talk about the uh, decisions, the formative decisions of our business. So the first decision that we made, which is a decision that every cannabis cultivator needs to make, is how to grow and where to grow. We've chosen to grow indoors. Um, we believe that growing indoors enables maximum control, which enables higher quality and ultimately bears out in premium pricing. We actually do a lot of research on the optimal cultivation parameters that exist, match those to specific crops, and always look to learn and improve as we go. We always say that QA is in our DNA. Uh, our head of quality assurance was employee number two at the company after the CEO. 
He came from leading two of the leading labs at one of the leading hospitals in the country, Mount Sinai Hospital. And we're proud to report we are the only company in this industry anywhere in the world, as far as we know, that is both ISO and GMP certified. We have over 400 quality control checks, and that includes product release testing that we implemented from the very beginning and is a major factor that you've seen in us not being the victims of a recall. We are patient-centric. We don't just pay lip service to this. Both myself and the CEO's mother are patients of MedRelief. Every product that we develop goes through the lens of whether or not we would be comfortable in having our families and ourselves consume the product. And it must be an unequivocal yes from all aspects and portions of the organization before we release that product to market. So patient safety, we test for over 300 pesticides and other contaminants since day one. That includes the now infamous microbutanol. Uh, we thought it was important to actually test for the products that are not allowed to be used as opposed to go by the fact that you're not supposed to use them. Therefore, let's just think that we don't. And we think this is a, a very important element uh, of our business. 89% customer satisfaction for a new and burgeoning industry like ours with a very uh, you know, a strong customer following. The obvious question is, where's the other 11%? The single largest variable for us in terms of patient dissatisfaction is around pricing. <coughs> Unfortunately, uh, as we chase returns and return on invested capital, uh, price is something that we're very comfortable with, and so we're very happy sitting at about this 90% level. We are not seeking to be all things to all people. We are seeking to generate returns for our shareholders by being the trusted medical suppliers to our customers, which ultimately should bear out in share price. So I mentioned this earlier in terms of our consumption relative to the industry average. Uh, we think about this business as a business. So from a customer acquisition standpoint, we thought about accessing channels and not just patients. So this was before I joined the company, but certainly early days, there was a license received, a crop growing, and the management team looked at each other and said, well, who the heck do we sell this to? And looking at and thinking about the pharmaceutical model, it became abundantly clear that the single element that was most important for distribution of pharmaceutical products was establishing third-party payers. And so that's what we sought. We researched the Canadian market. We realized that military veterans with specific conditions had insurance coverage from the government, and we aggressively pursued them. Why did we pursue them? One, we had data from our partners in Israel, Tikkun Olam, to show that they'd been treating military veterans with PTSD for over 10 years and doing so successfully. Translate that and couple it with the fact that this was really the only significant scale third-party payor. And we're very happy to report, fast forward two and a half years, not only do we have 50% market share in the military veteran space, we actually have a much more important metric which is a three and a half times relative market share to our next nearest peer, which means if we're at 15%, the next peer is 15%. When I think back to my days in private equity, relative market share was a very good rule of thumb for long-term and sustainable profitability in various markets. And so with that, given that only five to 6,000 veterans are serviced Today in the market, and our data shows that out of the hundreds of thousands that exist in Canada, at least 40,000 would be good eligible in terms of condition and good and eligible in terms of third-party payer coverage from Veterans Affairs Canada. We've set up, up, uh, we've set up a business to go and seek out those veterans and get them the medicine that they desperately need and deserve. At the same time, we've deployed our analytics to identify other high customer lifetime value segments. And so I'll chat about two of those briefly. For the Americans in the room, healthcare spending accounts are akin to flexible spending accounts in your insurance terminology. In Canada, cannabis, medical cannabis specifically, is an eligible medical expense. And what that means is that it is de facto eligible for these healthcare spending accounts. Couple that with the fact that our data shows that 40% of the dollars in healthcare spending accounts in Canada go unused on an annual basis. And we see a large and significant opportunity for high profitability by accessing this channel. And so we're out deploying uh, resources to educate organizations and their staff about using their existing healthcare spending accounts. And we've also partnered with a mid-sized insurance firm called Benefits by Design, BBD, to implement a cannabis-specific 
flexible healthcare spending account that can layer on top of the existing insurance coverage. Ultimately, this will play out in employee benefit plans. The Manulife's, Sun Life's, Great West Life's of the world do need more actuarial data before they can make a determination about inclusion. But ultimately, we believe that this will be, over the next several years, covered by insurance for certain conditions with certain formulations. I think you see the beginnings of that with one of Canada's largest employers, which is the Weston Group, Loblaws and Shoppers, implementing for their own staff employee benefits coverage specifically for cannabis. You've also seen some of the leading unions in the country, OPSU, the Ontario Public Service Employees Union, and LIUNA, implement this for some of their staff. And so we think the train has left the proverbial station on this front. We just need to supply the data to the insurers to get the actuaries comfortable with pricing for inclusion in the general formulary. We are a science-focused company. Uh, we employ more PhD and master's level scientists than any of our competitors. Right now we have 12 PhD and master's level scientists. They span the spectrum in terms of plant genetics, plant molecular biology, bios process engineering, food science, biochemistry, clinical research, and analytical chemistry to underpin the entire organization. We've also been very fortunate in an ability to establish in-kind partnerships with academic institutions, some of the best and brightest in Canada, and look to replicate that across the world. So you'll see lots of publications coming from us, the first of which will be together with Sunnybrook Health Sciences, one of the most respected healthcare institutions in Canada, in the Journal of Pain Management, and you'll see that over the coming months. Um, just to give you a sense of how we think about the world and why we're able to create what we believe is a long-term and sustainable competitive advantage in terms of our cultivation yields, it is not simply that we've produced 300 grams per year and our peers produce 150. We're not naive enough to believe that that in and of itself is long-term and sustainable. We are no smarter than anybody else, and they too will figure out how to get to 300. What we have done, though, and you'll see this permeated across all facets of our organization, is create a very robust process to capture data with a continuous improvement mindset such that we can continue to innovate and stay ahead of the curve. So to give you an example, in our original facility in Markham, we had 10 cultivation rooms. For simplicity, let's assume a 10-week growth cycle, when in fact it is less than that. So if you take a 10-week cycle with 10 rooms, you end up with 50 harvests per year one harvest per week for simplicity. That means that each and every week, we capture data across all of the inputs. And remember those seven inputs that I put up on the indoor slide. We've got temperature, humidity, CO2, uh, we've got uh, feed, we've got lighting, we've got plant formation and pruning techniques are the seven primary variables that we use. And we take all of the inputs and we correlate them with the outputs, both quantity and quality. We use multivariate regression and correlation analysis to determine which variables at which points of the growth cycle are actually making a difference for specific strains. And given that we're able to do that every single week and tweak the parameters for that next growth cycle, we believe that that in and of itself is a sustainable competitive advantage. If we do 50 harvests a year, and remember it is actually slightly more than that, our greenhouse peers do maybe three. And so it will take them a full 20 years to capture the same amount of data that we've captured to date. We will continue to do this. Our Bradford facility has 19 rooms, different configuration, larger size, continuous improvement across all facets, not just the inputs, but also the physical infrastructure. Um, we do believe in producing premium cannabis. So we've got our exclusive license on the Tikuno Lum varieties, which have a lot of patient data associated with them over the last 15 years. We've got over 15,000 seeds in our seed bank. We've got over 200 genetic varieties across a very robust breeding program. Um, if you look here at the photo on the left side, you see those are two actual strains that we have, and you can see the genetic differences in those even with the naked eye. Um, product lines, we actually, as of late last week, this is a dated slide, we do have 20 plus dried products. We have four oil products, four capsule products. We were the first and we're the only company to be selling pills, which is a real game changer for physicians. But actually, as of last week, we were the first company to get licensed with topical creams. And so we now have a fourth product line. Turning a little bit to uh, sort of the enophile or the wine lovers in the room, there is an element of subjective quality here. Uh, the leading uh, consumer review 
company in Canada is Lyft Cannabis, and we've consistently won awards from them in first place across a variety of categories, CBD, Sativa, Indica, and the like. Turning to growth drivers, really there are four key growth drivers here. There's the existing medical market, which will continue to grow. It's only fractionally penetrated today. Uh, between 200 and 250,000 patients in the program. Health Canada estimates 450,000. Our back of the envelope math suggests something closer to 2% of population and 700,000 patients. There's also new product categories and topical creams falls into this. Recreational or adult use, which will have a very wide spectrum of product categories in a very large market as Canada has the highest per capita consumption of cannabis of any country in the world except for Iceland. And ultimately international, as we seek to replicate our medical model in other markets which value the science, the research, the product quality uh, for their patients in country. Talk about these one by one. The annualized market size today is about 350 million. Health Canada thinks it's getting to 1.3 billion. Again, we believe that's something closer to 2 billion and will happily ride that curve. The critical growth factor here, and the reason why growth will not get to where people think it's going to get to as fast as it is going to, is around physician education. Only about 10% of Canadian physicians are prescribing cannabis today. There's not enough data. We admit that. That's what we're working on. Specifically, data around dosage and bioavailability, titration, and strain. And so we're investing both internally and with in-kind third-party research partnerships to develop just the kind of data that physicians are desiring. Clearly, combustible cannabis or combustion of any kind is not in a physician's toolkit. And so until we were able to put out oils and pills and now topicals, physicians were very reticent to actually prescribe a patient to go and smoke something. And this is really a game changer that we see evolving very quickly over the next year or two. Uh, we're the first licensed producer with an oil capsule product, as I mentioned. Uh, today, extracts comprise about 15% of our top line revenue. Ultimately, in Colorado and California, they comprise 50 to 60%, albeit with the caveat that they have more form factors as our government allows more form factors with higher concentrations, there's no reason that our market should not be somewhere around 50-50. And if you think back to the slide I showed around average price, clearly the price on value-added extracts is higher on a per gram equivalent basis than it is for dried cannabis. And so we see this being incremental to our profit margins on a per gram basis as we reach uh, sort of a median in the industry. Again, we do have a proven ability to launch new and novel products. Now, there's been two categories that MedRelief has been first and only. One is pills and now topical creams. We'll continue with that robust pipeline. The recreational market opportunity. So this $5 to $9 billion number comes from a seminal report from Deloitte, oft-referenced. Um, we like that report. Uh, we have a good relationship with Deloitte. And so we actually hired Darren Karasiak, who was the head of the cannabis consulting practice there to run our recreational strategy. And so what we've done is take this number and actually go three levels deeper, behavioral, attitudinal, socioeconomic, demographic, and ultimately parallel markets. Think choices in coffee, in beer, in cars, in clothes. We're data-driven and expert advised, and we've actually developed two brands based on our patient, uh, sorry, our customer uh, information uh, that we think will service the various segments of the market where we believe we can be most profitable and have the highest relative market share. We'll be launching those brands over the coming months as we understand better what the framework looks like for marketing and advertising. So exporting our expertise. We are the medical grade standard in Canada. It's in our name. The UN Convention on Narcotics stipulates that international narcotic exports and imports can only be for medical purposes. And so we think we're very well positioned to export our expertise and our products across the world. In Australia was our first partnership where we took back an equity and royalty position in exchange for our intellectual property. We have partners there that are in the late stages of the application process, and we do anticipate success over the near term. Uh, in Germany, uh, we are participating in the domestic cultivation RFP, 
Uh, we made it through to bid on all 10 lots. From what we understand, there's 10 companies across the world, the bulk of which are from Canada, which are in a similar position as us. And we'll work that through the process over the coming months. And ultimately in Brazil, we did a number of firsts there with one single export. It was the first commercial export, meaning for patient use to Brazil ever. It was also the first export of cannabis oil ever to Brazil. And so we're looking to build on that international expertise and leverage the strategic value that we bring to these international markets, both with exports and ultimately with domestic cultivation opportunities, albeit only on a commercial basis. Just a bit about management. So we do believe that being in Toronto has enabled us to attract the best in class management team that exists in this industry. Our CEO, Neil Klausner, 20 years of startup technology and healthcare experience, was the VP of business development, launching new and novel products and businesses in one of the most respected healthcare institutions in Canada. He's also the chairman of the industry association. I come from a private equity background, um, bringing a sort of a diverse industry lens to improving operations and generating the best returns on invested capital that exist in our industry. Three months ago, we're very pleased to have hired Don Courtney as our COO, 20 years of global operations and supply chain experience. Most interestingly, he was the director of operations at Vincor, which was the largest Canadian wine producer before it got sold to Constellation Brands. If you think about that market and our market, many, many similarities, one of which we didn't even anticipate, which is our end market distributors in Ontario, which is the largest market in Canada, are actually the same company that distributes alcohol. So we knew there was parallels and similarities on the production and supply chain side. We didn't realize it was also on the distribution side. Etan Popper, one of our co-founders and our president, 15 years of large-scale international infrastructure project development. He's a master's in fluid dynamics from Stanford as well as an MBA. Angelo was employee number two, our VP clinical affairs and quality compliance. Um, Let's just say that the air quality in our rooms, our cultivation rooms, is the same as operating rooms. They're called Class A clean rooms, operating rooms in a hospital, and that is all from Angelo's um, foresight. And Darren, as I mentioned, uh, was VP Insights and Advisory at Deloitte, where he was the leader in the cannabis practice. I think importantly, um, management owns a significant portion of this business. A very material portion of our net worth is invested in this business. We ride sidecar with the rest of our shareholders so to wrap up, uh, we do believe that this industry will have a shakeout over the next number of years, whether by consolidation or otherwise. And we believe that winners will emerge and dominate. And we believe that Medrelief will emerge as the winner in cannabis. Thank you, Isor. What's your extraction method? We use supercritical CO2. Um, very simple reason, because it is not the most efficient technique. Ethanol extraction and, frankly, even butane extraction is more efficient, um, but it's not safe for kids with epilepsy. Um, uh, ethanol, you need other co-solvents, and same with butane, to get the product out, and then you have to actually post-process it in order to get rid of the trace elements. Um, we're just not comfortable with that. Again, the lens being that we are patients. I'll give a quick anecdote on, on butane. Butane extraction is allowed in Canada, but you have to build a bunker to put the machine in. The operator of the machine goes in the bunker with the machine. That's not acceptable to us. I had a question on capital allocation. You guys did your IPO, you're overcapitalized in some ways, but I'm sure you have some, some things that's earmarked for besides working capital. What are the highest priorities? Sure, so I think capital allocation is really what sets us apart. So just to give a quick history, um, we raised about $15 million at the outset of this business over the first year. Um, every single financial metric that you see was generated on the back of a $15 million investment and not a dollar more. Last summer, so summer of 2016, we did the largest private non-brokered capital raise ever done in the space. We raised $25 million. We deployed that capital to buy our Bradford facility and to start building out the infrastructure there. Then as Alan pointed out, June 7th, we did the first ever long form prospectus IPO ever done in this industry. We raised $100 million, which was the largest capital raise ever done in this industry. Um, we earmarked $40 million from that raise of the $80 million of treasury to uh, finish building out the Bradford facility. We earmarked $15 million for pharmaceutical manufacturing capabilities and a couple million for product development. Ultimately, 
Couple that with the fact that we're the only company in this industry that has commercial credit from one of the big five banks in Canada. And we have about $40 million of excess capital that's not earmarked today. We're very opportunistic. Both myself and the CEO come from a capital markets background, so we understand M&A. Um, we will not sort of discuss here what exactly that capital is going to be used for, but needless to say, we expect to generate similar returns for our shareholders in the same way that we have in the past. Clearly, if today we're an 18% market share, and ultimately we anticipate just the Canadian recreational medical markets to be somewhere between 1,000 and 1,500 tons per year, let's take the lower end of that and go to 1,000. Our Bradford and Markham facilities can only produce 35 tons at scale. So you have to only make a leap of faith that we'll go from 18% to 3.5%, and we'll still sell every gram that we produce. Clearly, 3.5% 3, 3 is untenable for us, although we don't think about the world in terms of overall market share. I think any company that defines market share in the single digits is not defining their market appropriately. And so we think about relative market share in the significant markets that we look to service. And so that is where we'll deploy the rest of the capital. And do you think any new builds would be uh, only uh, like you're doing now, uh, indoor, or might you consider other? We would definitely consider all types of facilities. There's different uses for end products. Uh, greenhouse builds and hybrid greenhouse builds are much faster to go to market, albeit by our calculations generate slightly lower returns over the long term. In cases where speed to market and raw material, so extract specifically is important, uh, we would certainly consider that. So uh, we are very opportunistic. We don't um, make decisions in advance of actually understanding the landscape that's available to us. And so we're evaluating many things. The one sort of point I'll make on it is we are very judicious in the way we allocate capital. It has to make sense from an operational logistical standpoint and not just work well for a press release. Go ahead. Good to your facility. It's incredibly, incredibly impressive. Um, I just want to know what your plans are for the U.S. market. Are you guys planning on coming here? Unless they're on, the, on that, but like... Um, we understand the U.S. is the largest consumer market in the world. We understand that it's also the largest market for cannabis. Unfortunately, the way the regulatory framework is today, um, we're sort of locked out of the market for a couple of reasons. Um, I'm not so fussed about the capital markets, but more so about our institutional investors. So if you look at the recent filings, and I mentioned this on the panel earlier, uh, JP Morgan's Global Healthcare Fund, so JPMAM, was a significant investor in our IPO. Um, they have Chase feet on the street. Um, and there are several other investors like that, which would like us to focus on Canada and the international platform that it has established for us. Couple that with our bank financing, and it makes it challenging to pursue the US. We're not ruling it out. There's always opportunities and we'll make the decision that's going to generate the highest returns for our investors, broadly spoken. But today, there's nothing specific we're looking at at the United States. Uh, do you have, or can you maybe just talk a little bit about the process that's going on in Germany with the 10 applications that are in there and, and the timeline that you expect sure. to occur and then maybe when you might hear uh, you know, either kind of a, a, a yay or nay? Sure, so um, there was the original process uh, which was an RFP by the EU regulations. It asked for submissions to actually then put in the real RFP. So this was basically a pre-clearance. You didn't have to put in economics. You just had to put your qualifications. And so 10 companies were selected as far as we understand it, uh, one of which is Medrelief, to bid on the 10 lots that exist. Ultimately, that RFP is insignificant in terms of scale relative to what we believe the German market opportunity is. And what I mean by that is 85 million people, mandatory insurance coverage, uh, very westernized medicine program, and very sophisticated regulatory framework. 2,000 kilos, which is all 10 lots combined, by our calculations is three to five business days of product. And that's an RFP for a full year. And there's a number of reasons why they might have done it that way. I'm not going to speculate why that could be. But we are participating. We think it is a very interesting foot in the door uh, what we are concerned about is the uneconomic behavior of some of our peers. Uh, and so we are evaluating very carefully the pricing um, and the capital investment that's required there. Needless to say, Germany is a place where we absolutely want to participate, where we will participate in one way or another. 
uh, without giving away too much on the actual strategy of the RFP. Um, it is quite complex in terms of understanding what the overall endpoint is versus what this small original RFP is. And it's sort of reading the tea leaves to get there. When do we expect to hear? Probably early next year, but we don't have a definitive answer on that. It's getting pushed out, it seems like. Well, they've restarted the process, right? So they, they did the original 10, and then they reached out to everybody and said, hold on a second, we've had some challenges from people that were not accepted. We've re-reviewed the process. They extended the application. So now the applications are due in November. Um, and ultimately, it is a large and complex process for the government. We expect at least a couple months for them to make a decision. And when you talk about just some of the bad actors in the application process, yeah. are you are you are you saying that folks are, I guess, promising oversized investment dollars going in, or, or in what in what way? No. So if you think about the Canadian market today, and you think about economics 101, um, markets where demand far outstrips supply tend not to be price competitive, and yet we see many of our peers competing on price. That is irrational, and there's many reasons for that. You can draw your own inferences, and clearly they're not business reasons or economic reasons. Um, <laughs> and so we fear that that same mindset might translate into, in essence, bids below the marginal cost of production. What, what, what makes you think this is going on? How do you learn of this information? Uh, we just we observe behavior in Canada. We know at least half of the bidders in Germany are Canadian. We know that some have made significant promises to their shareholder base that they are going to win without any insight as to how that process actually looks. And putting those things together, it's not something I'm saying is going to happen, but it's something we're thinking about. But how do they marry that with you know promising their shareholders a win in Germany, but then ultimately delivering negative margins yeah, to their shareholders? Yeah. Worry about that then. <laughs> so we're the only profitable company in this industry over the long term. Afria has had a couple quarters of profitability, and we think they're they're good operators. Um, you tell me how uh, companies that generate negative returns for shareholders have share price appreciation, but it exists in our market. I, I don't ascribe to that philosophy, but some do. Well, maybe the idea is they get a foothold, and then the next, you know, the next iteration they, they, that's they make it's possible and everybody makes their own decisions i mean people know things that we don't know and that's fine and everyone can make their own decision the nice thing is only 40 percent of that bid is related to price i, I saw you have brand x and brand y not very good names no i'm just kidding no. but uh when, when did you say i don't have to change them <laughs> when did you uh you're studying putting a lot of research and thought into it when, what's the time frame? So we actually have two brands fully developed. Um, we've worked in-house and with some significant uh, statisticians to actually analyze that three layers of data that goes beyond the Deloitte report, behavioral, attitudinal, uh, socioeconomic, demographic, and ultimately parallel markets. We have worked with an outside consultant who we believe is the best retail brand advisory company in the country. We've developed two brands that target those specific markets where we think we can have the highest relative market share. And we will deploy those as soon as we get a better understanding of what is actually allowed. We don't want to find ourselves in a position where we announce something and we're ultimately not allowed to follow through on it. So you guys have developed a premium product. I assume your recreational products are mimicking what you've been doing with this one? Some of them, yes. Um, we do see uh, pockets of profitability across a wide spectrum of consumer types. So low volume... Low, uh, low price elasticity of demand, meaning high price, low consumption. There's certainly profits there. There's also, you know, the buck a beer category. Um, pick up a 12 pack, you know, every other day after work. There's significant profitability there. And I think the the question is, um, talking about beer companies, you know, who who would you like to emulate? And the reality is, usually the significant beer companies actually have a portfolio of brands that hits a number of those segments. And so we've started with two brands but we actually have identified five segments that we'd like to serve. Oops, and uh, we'll continue to expand on that as, as time goes on. You talked about your ROI discipline. Is that, is there a hard and fast kind of hurdle rate or target rate that, that you're gonna ascribe to or is it? No, I mean, I, I think, uh, I sort of think back to uh, certainly before my time in private equity, but uh, the times when there was 50% IRR uh, investment opportunities that were thrown out because they weren't good enough. 
because there were 75 and 100% IRR opportunities available. So to draw a line in the sand is not what we do. Um, what we do is ask ourselves a lot of or decisions. So do we do this or that? And ultimately, we have a limited amount of capital to deploy. And we will deploy it where we think we will generate the highest returns. We can't be all things to all people. And so we make our decisions in isolation on every single opportunity. Some of them near-term return on invested capital. Some of them long-term return on invested capital. I had a question on IP. Uh, a lot of your peers have been reaching into the United States or other places to develop new products for the future and some for now as well. Do you guys, I know you have the Israeli connection on genetics and all that, but are there other companies you're working with for IP? Um, on the product side, there are companies that we're working with. Um, I think we take a slightly different view uh, in that we like to own um, our intellectual property. That doesn't mean we wouldn't sign licensing deals with new and novel technologies. Um, the reality in the U.S. is brand, even those that are well known, have about a 2% market share. And so, you know, to say that they are dominant is, is certainly a stretch. And so we look for specific opportunities to do licensing and partnerships. But typically, um, those are opportunities where there's mutual value. So we recognize that there's either a new product or a new category. And they realize that with our um, focus on research and development and our access to both physicians and patients in Canada and our processes can create mutual beneficial opportunities. And obviously, um, ultimately, a global. Yeah. 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 yeah, Canacorp is a good example of that. Any other questions? Thousand. <laughs> yeah. Um, any side effects? So any of the or any of those that I'm, I'm, I'm not a physician. I'm not, <laughs> unable to answer that question. All right. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. In terms of uh, your physician education outreach, uh, are you collecting any data on drug drug interactions? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. We think we have the most robust data set when we couple the Israeli data with our own data. We do detailed patient intake and po patient follow-up surveys over time. They are statistically significant. They're efficacious. They're designed not just with our internal statisticians, but also with third-party academia. And we certainly look at that. We can't force our patients to disclose condition because that's not part of the, the rules in, in Canada. A physician can, doesn't have to write what the prescription, what the condition is. They can just write a prescription. But many of our patients do. What we found in the early days is Patients self-select into this program. They want to help. And so we have a lot of information on drug-drug interactions. Um, one study that is posted and available on our website, it's not a, you know, a double-blind placebo. It's a retrospective chart review done by a third party uh, with a physician who prescribes our products primarily, uh, showed a significant reduction in opioid usage. No surprise. And so I think you see that generally in any state where there's any type of cannabis legislation, whether medical or recreational, there are negative correlation to alcohol consumption, negative correlation to opioid consumption. So. Um, question. So what we've seen here in the U.S. is when a recreational market comes to a medical use market, it disrupts the growth of the medical market. Now with Canada coming on board with recreational use next year, how are you thinking about how that may disrupt the growth of your business? Sure, so there's very likely there's some patients in the medical program that will say, I don't wanna bother with this, I don't wanna to go to the doctor, I can just go to the store. But ultimately, we actually think that it is possible that from a physician standpoint, now that they know that somebody can just go to the store and buy it, they may actually be more inclined to prescribe, that way at least they can monitor sort of the regimen that, that the person is on. Um, the other element is economic. So if you look at Colorado, if you look at sort of what we expect in California, 2% of population to stay in medical, even though there's a parallel recreational program. Uh, we anticipate nothing different here. There might be a little blip in the beginning. Ultimately, it's the same input, the same product that goes across both uh, markets. So in the long term, we don't see a particular challenge, especially given that taxation will be different. And ultimately, insurance coverage will only be available for those in the medical market. And is, so, it, is it sold at the same price? There is no recreational sales today. So there's only a direct-to-consumer channel, so we don't know ultimately what the pricing is going to be. Um, we know that the excise tax that will be levied on adult-use cannabis will not be levied on medical cannabis, even though it could be the same. 
Yeah, they're seeing a dollar a gram, 10%. Yeah. There's sort of a... Yeah, dollar yeah, a yeah. And, and then sort of as a follow-up, so what we're also seeing in the U.S. is that there, the bifurcation of a market really doesn't exist or won't exist and that we're seeing a combination of the two. Um, do you think that will play out in, in Canada as well, where the medical and the rec will be combined and overseen by one regulatory body? So I don't have a good answer to that question. Um, today, they're overseen by separate bodies, but they actually took the person that used to run the medical prog program and put them to run now what is going to be the recreational program federally. So there's clearly some inextricable linkage. Uh, ultimately, it is the same product, but the current iteration of the medical program is federal, and the current iteration of the recreational programs are provincial. So query as to where that lands, but I think different would be my guess. Okay. Thank you. One last question, Tom. If you, that so, was it, actually, the medical. Why, you know, billion eight, or actually, what year was that billion eight thinking? So it's very interesting. So Health Canada projected by 2024, exactly 10 years after the inception of this program, that there would be 450,000 patients. And it's an exponential curve. We today are between 200 and 250,000. So we are already at the 2021 estimates. So our assertion is that it's not 450,000, it's closer to 700,000, probably still by 2024. So that billion one estimate was 2024? That was billion three, and that was their estimate. Yeah, there was a, that was their estimate for 2024. To be fair, they didn't estimate revenue. They estimated volume, and we layer onto that average pricing to infer what the revenue would look like. I think, we unfortunately, we've hit the end of our time. Uh, you are, uh, can stay a few minutes and speak outside the room, but I want to thank you for uh, telling the story today. Thank you. Thanks, Alan, and thank you to the, uh, the conference. Appreciate it.